Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to kick off our engagement process for our climate action plan. Uh, the last time the city updated its climate action plan was 2013, so we definitely have some work to do and we need your input um, to be successful. So this is one of um, six workshops that we'll be hosting over the next couple months. And so each workshop, we're gonna start off with a special guest speaker, um, and then we'll talk more about our climate action plan, and then we will divide into breakout groups to hear your feedback. So I'd like to introduce our first guest, uh, Kate Gordon was appointed to the director of Gavin Newsom's Office of Planning and Research. And she is in two, January of uh, 2019. And she is also a senior advisor to the governor on climate. And with that, I'd like to have uh, Kate uh, start us off with a couple with a presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cindy, and everybody uh, for the invitation. And it's just exciting that you're embarking on this process. It's so important. All of the work we do on climate uh, at the federal level and the state level really is implemented at the local level. So really excited that you're focusing on this. Um, I'm just going to say, you know, maybe uh, 10 minutes or so uh, on some of the state priorities that are the framework for the work that you're doing on the Climate Action Plan. Just for reference, the Office of Planning and Research um, is a, uh, an office within the governor's office. We are responsible for providing advice and counsel to the governor and the cabinet on long range planning issues. Those primarily are land use and planning, which is obviously very relevant to this conversation. Um, we do the guidance to local governments on CEQA as well as on general plans. Um, we also are uh, um, the main place in the state that does climate resilience. Um, so the physical impacts of climate change and increasingly looking at how to change our financing systems so that we're incorporating climate risks into how we think about um, our state budget and spending. And then we also do um, a fair amount of work on long range uh, sustainable economic development. So really looking at ways that how we're growing the economy and creating jobs integrate, inter interacts with our climate solutions, one of the ways we're doing that is leading the state's just transition strategy. So those are some of the big picture things that we're doing. I urge you to go to our website. We just redid it. So it's actually kind of, um, um, uh, uh, you know, new and exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk for a minute, you can go to the next slide, about some of the governor's priorities on climate. The governor really uh, takes, um, you know, he did this before President Biden. He takes an all of government approach on climate change. We have a Climate Cabinet, which is a subgroup of our cabinet, um, which is about uh, seven different agencies and three departments, all of whom are thinking about climate change as part of an integral part of how they do business. That includes transportation, housing, um, obviously Cal EPA, uh, the resources agency, but also GoBiz, our economic and business development office, um, as well as uh, as many others. So it's, a, it's an exciting approach, I think. And so you'll see that uh, play out in our climate strategy. There's a couple of big pieces of what the governor's really focused on. When I came into my job, he asked me, you know, where have we made goals and where have we made progress? And we have a lot of goals, as you probably know, in the state of California, so does, so does San Francisco. Lots and lots of things we've said we were gonna do. Um, he wanted to know, he's an implementation guy. He wanted to know where, where, where are we on those? The reality is that we are behind on several of them. One of them is transportation. Um, transportation is if you count extraction and refining, 51% of our carbon emissions in California, 40% um, if you don't count those things. And so we are just not making as much progress here as we are in electricity. Electricity, we're actually coming down really nicely on emissions and building efficiency as well. Transportation has actually been rising in terms of demand um, uh, for, for fossil fuels for the last many, many, many years. So we're really focusing in on transportation through a variety of things um, on the vehicle and fuel side through an executive order that the governor just signed saying that we will not sell combustion engine vehicles in the state starting in 2035. Um, and also that we'll see a transformation in the heavy and medium duty, medium and heavy duty truck fleet by 2045. Last year, he also signed an executive order that called for our transportation agency to align its discretionary programs with our climate goals, which means much bigger focus on reducing vehicle miles traveled, which is a huge part of our goal and I know San Francisco's goal on transportation. Next slide. 
Um, the next big piece of, uh, of planning where we haven't made it as much progress as we need to um, is on land use. So land use planning, which is what my office does, it's hard, it's long-term, you don't see the results right away, but we all know, and you in particular, that how you, where and how you build housing um, and transportation systems is the key to climate reducing emissions in your local area and in your region. So we are very focused at, um, in the state at marrying our transportation and housing strategies with our climate strategy and really aligning our, our subsidies, our CEQA streamlining, whatever processes we can toward location efficient housing, infill housing, infill grant program, infrastructure grant programs and um, toward transportation, active transportation programs. And that's been a real push of this governor. Next slide. Um, we're increasingly focused on something that I actually did a lot of work on before this job, uh, but have brought into the administration and the governor's very focused on it now, which is incorporating climate risk into our decision making. One thing we're increasingly realizing in California in particular, but really everywhere in the world is that climate impacts are happening to us today. We have to do, we have to stay very aggressive on reducing emissions, but we also have to be very aggressive on adaptation and resilience. And part of that is spending on infrastructure and systems in a way that is resilient. So if we continue to build really lovely low carbon infrastructure that's in a floodplain, that's not very helpful to that infrastructure. If we continue to build, you know, um, uh, really beautiful bike lanes that are gonna you know, fall into the ocean, that's not good infrastructure. So we need to think about these things together, especially for multi-decade infrastructure like buildings and transportation networks and water systems and all the things we all think about all the time and our grid, of course. So we're doing a strategy in um, the state government to look at our own spending through our agencies. We own a lot of assets and we manage a lot of assets um, and we do a lot of investment through our pension funds. And looking at that as a strategy to actually ramp up um, incorporating climate risk into our decision making, including through potentially mandatory disclosure, which we're, governor has asked us to explore um, this year. So that's a big push. Next slide. Um, and finally, you know, one of the things that we are starting to talk about a lot, and you're hearing a lot more on, and San Francisco has been a leader on, is um, is, is decarbon is the other side of infrastructure, um, not only making it more resilient, but decarbonizing infrastructure. And so we're looking through our our, Ener our energy commission and our PUC at um, at decarbonization. Next slide. So one of the big questions we face, and you will have to as well with this climate action plan, is how do you do all this in a post-COVID world? COVID has had a profound impact on systems and infrastructure and planning in the state of California as everywhere. It will make a difference for years to come. We are not going to bounce back from this situation exactly the same as we were going into it. And I think it's a folly to think we will. There are systems that will have to change. So next slide. One of the big ones is just having our overall economy be more resilient. And by resilient here, I really mean resilient in every way you can think of that term. What we learned from COVID is that the system as it currently stands is not sustainable. Um, we saw the cracks in terms of inequality, in terms of racial justice, in terms of access, in terms of affordability. Those cracks have only deepened. The numbers are, San Francisco is a great example of that. The, um, looking at the numbers from the impact of COVID on the economy, the pieces of the economy that are white collar jobs where telework is possible have actually done quite well in San Francisco. And in fact, most of the highest income earners in the city have actually dramatically expanded their incomes during COVID. The other side of the coin, which is all the retail and service establishments that serve all of those industries have gone away. I mean, we've essentially lost thousands and thousands of jobs that are not coming back. There's only been a 30% return of jobs from the beginning of COVID to now in San Francisco. So this is something that is not sustainable and can't continue. We have got to look at, in doing climate planning, we have to look at resilience across access, inclusion, broadband, you know, ability to have high quality jobs. Without having that kind of resilience, we will lose allies on climate and we will lose the ability for people to access the technologies and the programs that they need to, to be part of the climate solution. So I'm just really urging that that be part of your conversation. Next slide. So again, the big question is how do we meet our climate goals and protect the health and, and economic prosperity of our most vulnerable communities? And this is just a, you know, just a, a reminder of, of where we see 
where we see those vulnerable communities in, in the Bay Area and San Francisco. Next slide. Now, one thing people will say is, but wasn't COVID great in terms of in increasing telework and doesn't that like solve all of our transportation emissions problems? Um, and this is important. I think importantly, you know, what you see here uh, is air quality statistics and you know, the, the green is better, good, and then the yellow is slightly better, the orange is slightly better, or, sorry, worse. Green is best and then it goes to worse to, down to purple. And what you see is yes, in fact, through the months of COVID, you get more green than you would have before because people weren't driving as much. And then all of a sudden it goes to red and purple because of the wildfires. So A, cars are not the only reason air quality is bad. But B, what you see on the right is, what we're seeing is a big recovery in driving. And the reason for that is about transit. The reason for that is that when tra with transit falling apart, which it essentially has in many places, we have drivers who are essential workers who are, now, are low income, who are now buying used cars who used to take transit. So we have an increase in vehicles and an increase in driving by the most essential workers and low income workers who are usually driving cars that are the least efficient. So this is actually not necessarily playing out the way we thought. The other thing that we see from other countries that have recovered faster, but we're starting to see in California is um, is that telework doesn't necessarily reduce VMT because if you have somebody who used to work in downtown San Francisco and they had one big commute, they would combine trips. They would stop on the way home to get groceries. They would stop on the way somewhere to get their kids. Now you have multiple trips coming out of your home office. So it's actually increasing VMT in some circumstances. Next slide. And I'm almost done, I promise. Um, the state is putting a big premium on reducing vehicle miles traveled because we think it's still a high priority, even despite telework and some of the, the trends. Um, we, uh, we, as you probably know, have, um, have incorporated uh, VMT analysis into CEQA. So now when you're doing any land use or transportation project, you actually have to measure the impact on VMT. That's a big change as of July 1st of this year and one that, that local governments I know are struggling with, but really important to the climate conversation. Don't forget about VMT. That's, that's one of my main messages here. Next slide. Critical to, to reducing VMT is transit. We have got to get transit back. It is the core infrastructure for lower income Californians and particularly in the Bay Area. It is, if we don't get transit back on track, people will switch to cars. Most of those people cannot afford electric cars today. They're buying used cars, they're buying crappy used cars. So this is a high, high, high priority for you in San Francisco, I know, but for us at the state as well. Um, not only within the city transportation, but also looking at high-speed rail and its connection to regional rail and the critical importance of replacing some of those 80,000 people a day who come over the Altamont Pass to work in San Francisco. Next and almost last slide is housing, 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 housing. The only way we're gonna reduce VMT in the state of California is to build more infill housing. If there is one thing you can do at the local level to support a climate agenda, it is to support housing production. It's the most important thing from a California, all of California perspective. It's where we're failing today. It's the most important thing we can do at the local level. You guys have actually been, the MTC area in general has actually been pretty good on this. The rest of the state not, but we even even within the MTC area, we see some real challenges with local governments opposing housing projects. This is a critical piece of the puzzle and highly encourage you to elevate it in as you're doing your planning. And I think that's it. Last slide is just a thank you slide. And that's me. That's where you can find me. I am very findable. Um, and so great talking to all of you.